Thanks for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Jeremy Garber, and I'm the events coordinator for PALS Books here in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I wanted to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at pals.com. On Wednesday, we're excited to welcome Jim Tankersley for his new book, The Riches of This Land, The Untold True Story of America's Middle Class. We'll be joined in conversation by the Oregonian's Amy Wang. If you haven't already done so, please sign up for our weekly events email at pals.com. As well, please consider following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight, we are absolutely honored to welcome Susan Nossel and Jacob Weisberg. Susan Nossel is the CEO of PEN America, the foremost organization working to protect and advance human rights, free expression, and literature. She has also served as the Chief Operating Officer of Human Rights Watch and as Executive Director of Amnesty International USA and has held senior State Department positions in both the Clinton and Obama administrations. A graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, Nossel frequently writes op-eds for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other publications, as well as a regular column for Foreign Policy Magazine. In her new book, Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All, Nossel delivers a vital necessary guide to maintaining democratic debate that is open, freewheeling, but at the same time respectful of the rich diversity of backgrounds and opinions in a changing country. At a time when free speech is often pitted against other progressive axioms, namely diversity and equality, Speak Free presents a clear-eyed argument that the drive to create a more inclusive society need not and must not compromise robust protections for free speech. And it also warns against the increasingly fashionable embrace of expanded government and corporate controls over speech, warning that such strictures can reinforce the marginalization of lesser heard voices. She argues that creating an open market of ideas demands aggressive steps to remedy exclusion and ensure equal participation. Dare to Speak has earned the praise of so many, including Hillary Rodham Clinton, Salman Rushdie, Margaret Atwood, Steven Pinker, Andrew Solomon, Nadine Strassen, Dave Eggers, Henry Louis Gates Jr., and more. Nossel is joined in conversation tonight by Jacob Weisberg. He is the CEO of Pushkin Industries, an audio publishing company he co-founded with Malcolm Gladwell in 2018. Pushkin produces audiobooks and podcasts, including Revisionist History, Against the Rules with Michael Lewis, The Happiness Lab with Lori Santos, and Solvable, a show about solving the world's biggest problems, which Weisberg co-hosts. He's covered national politics as a journalist at the New Republic, Newsweek, and New York Magazine before joining Slate in 1996. He was editor of Slate from 2002 to 2008 and is the author of books including Ronald Reagan and the Bush Tragedy. He is also vice chair of the Committee to Protect Journalists. This evening's event will also include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please consider upvoting that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting both Suzanne and PALS by purchasing a copy of Dare to Speak from us. A link to pre-order the book, to order the book, will be shared in the chat this evening. And this evening's event is sponsored by PEN America, and we're so very grateful to them for supporting us in this important conversation. Suzanne, Jacob, it's an honor to welcome you both tonight. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you, Jeremy, and, and thanks to PALS, um, which is, uh, to me, one of the greatest bookstores in the world and the kind of place I feel we've been sadly not able to visit during the pandemic. But I gather that Powell's is, is opening up physically as well as its tremendous online presence. And going back to bookstores, I know for me is one of the, the most important things. It will be one of the most important signs that we that civilization and normality has begun to return. Yeah, agreed. Uh, there are a few that have opened up uh, in, in New York City and other places I've been, and it's, it's a great relief. Somewhere to go. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I have a lot I want to talk to you about, Suzanne, and I, sh I should say Suzanne and I have, have worked together for many years at Penn, where, where I serve on the board as well, and I've, you know, certainly seen her involvement in issues of free speech over a long period of time and seen how effective she's been. Um, weighing in in defense of free speech. But I guess the first question I want to ask you, Suzanne, is why did you feel you needed to write a book now defending free speech? Because I think for many years at Penn, we felt that uh, 
we were defending broadly shared principles. Uh, and, you know, we, they, we, it was, it's always important to articulate them. But what's different now that prompted you to do this? Sure. I mean, look, I would say over the last four years in particular, the America in Pen America has never been quite as weighty uh, as it feels now. And we see free speech under threat from so many different quarters, whether it's the President of the United States and his attacks and threats directed at journalists or efforts to muzzle publications, social media companies holding such powerful sway over vast swaths of our public discourse, or what I focus on in the book, which is a rising generation that I worry is becoming increasingly alienated from the principle of free speech. We do a lot of work at PEN America on free speech on college campuses, and I've traveled to a lot of college campuses and had the chance to talk with students. And what I've found in recent years is that the drive to effectuate a more equal, inclusive, and just campus and society, which is imperative and which has accelerated over the last few months in the wake of the murder of George Floyd with the rise of the protest movement and the uh, efforts at police reform, that very worthy social justice effort at times is coming at the expense of free speech protections. There are moments at which it often arises in relation to hateful speech, slurs, bigotry, stereotypes, the impulse can be that in order to create a campus that's truly welcoming to all, where everybody can have a sense of belonging, where students uh, of color can feel uh, included and not ostracized, that those forms of speech challenge that and undercut that and can make people feel victimized, isolated, targeted. And so at times that movement has called for bans or punishments directed at speech. That's not their primary purpose, but it can be a byproduct of their agenda. And as I learned about this and heard from students who saw free speech as a conservative cause, as a smokescreen for hatred, as something that was invoked time and again to defend speech that they saw as menacing or nefarious, I came to worry that we were at risk of losing a rising generation when it comes to this core principle of free speech, something that I grew up cherishing that as a law student and a, and a young lawyer, I, I, I always valued. So at first when I heard students sort of spurning the First Amendment of free speech, I thought, God, what has happened? But as I spoke to them, I could understand where they were coming from and how it was that they at times saw the defense of free speech as at odds with their agenda. And I became kind of seized with this idea that we had to convince them otherwise and demonstrate and explain how these principles of equity, inclusion, and justice on the one hand and the robust defense on free speech on the other could and, and needed to be reconciled, how they were each stronger if they reinforced one another. And so that really was my main purpose in, in writing this book was to set that out and try to convince a rising generation that, hey, free speech has something to offer you. And in fact, it's instrumental to the goals that you are focused on achieving. Why do you think, Suzanne, that we are seeing this shift in the view of free speech from seeing it as fundamentally a tool of liberation to seeing it increasingly as a tool of oppression. In the, in the civil rights era, the, the era of Martin Luther King and John Lewis, there's just no question that, that um, African-American activists as a whole saw free speech as on their side. It was a necessary tool uh, for them to, to, to fight segregation and change the country in the way they did. And now many young activists, as you see, say, see it very differently. Um, what happened, do you think, that prompted, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to overstate that shift because I don't want to, you know, overcharacterize the, the skeptical view of free speech, but it's absolutely out there, as you say, and very strongly on campus. What's driving it? Yeah, I mean, I think one explanation lies in sort of this phase that we're in of this, you know, long-term drive to become a more equal and inclusive society. So when Martin Luther King and other leaders in the civil rights movement were marching to gain formal equality, the ability to sit at a restaurant or a lunch counter, or ride a bus, uh, or desegregate a school, uh, 
you know, they were attacking these very tangible legal barriers to inclusion and equality. And they needed free speech rights in order to be able to petition, to demonstrate in the streets, to lodge their protests, to do the March on Washington, and, and to take forward the mechanisms that they had to make noise, to rally a movement, to gain attention for their cause. The role of the press was critical uh, in shining a light on some of the harsh tactics. And you know, those of us who've seen the images will never forget the, the water cannons and the dogs. And, and those made international headlines and ratcheted up the pr pressure dramatically on both state officials and the federal government to make change and eventually uh, adopt the Civil Rights Act. You know, now we're at a very different phase where the kind of change that people are striving to achieve is often not legal. It's sort of cultural. It's about how we relate to one another, how we speak to one another, how we think of one another, uh, what the dynamics are in a room, who gets hired for a position. It's much more subtle uh, and much more internalized. And I think in that circumstance, you know, it, it is, it, you know and, and the problem has intensified over the last few years with this sort of uncorking of hateful speeches and attitudes in, in the Trump era, where you have the president attacking immigrants and people of color and women and minorities, religious minorities, and hateful speech and hate crimes on the increase across society. The impulse now is to protect people from that. And that is seen as sort of the next level of uh, attainment in, in the drive for equality is that people should not be subject to these sorts of, you know, denigrating derogatory expression. And that as long as that is pervaded and tolerated, you know, we're going to have, we're going to be stuck with an unequal society. And so I think it's that reaching up to this next level of trying to uh, generate a more substantive equality that kind of transcends all social settings, all employment settings, all human interactions, you know, that's where this question of policing really comes in. You know, 40, 50 years ago, you know, people saying slurs or, or shouting down students as they walked up the steps of Little Rock High School, that wasn't the issue. I mean, their issue was getting inside the high school and being able to sit down and take a class. You know, the, 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 the denigrating comments were sort of almost a sideshow because the substantive rights uh, that were at stake were much larger. But now we're on to sort of a different level where these nuances of speech, you know, really are standing in the way at, at, at some level uh, and in some people's eyes of, of the attainment of equality. Yeah, I mean, as you say, Suzanne, a lot of it comes down to this question of hate speech and whether it should be tolerated and allowed in, in different contexts. And liberal societies do diverge on that. I mean, under the First Amendment in the United States, hate speech is protected. Uh, incitement to violence isn't. Uh, you know, there, 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 are, there are limits around the extremes, but you can do hate speech legally in the United States. You can't in many Western European countries. I think Germany probably has the strictest restrictions, but you know you can't wear a swastika in Germany. You can in the United States. It's protected speech. Do you think, have you come at all to question the American model of the absolutist approach to free speech and think, hey, maybe we don't need to protect some of the extremes of hate speech that we do protect in this country? You know, I would say this. I mean, what I've definitely come to is in protecting a lot of this speech, it's not as if we're protecting something that is worthy and in of itself deserving of protection. It's not that, you know, slurs have social value or that bigoted expression uh, is something that we need to safeguard in order to sustain a free society. I don't believe that, but what I do believe is that the minute you give a, go a government the power to adjudicate what constitutes hateful speech, that you open the door to a series of problems. And you know, the first is obvious, which is who decides what hateful speech is? And I think the Trump administration is a great illustration of how that meaning could easily be distorted. I mean, when people ask for 
broader governmental protections of speech, I think they kind of have this vision of some combination of Thurgood Marshall and Barack Obama and, you know, Justice Ginsburg, you know, all coming together and, and, and making these distinctions. But of course, you know, there's no guarantee of that. And in the hands of Donald Trump, you know, hateful speech would be his political detractors. It would be the work of journalists. It would be people who call him out for his misogyny and attacks on women. And so I think that power, you can see how easily it could be distorted. And then, you know, the other problem is what is really the objective standard when it comes to hateful speech? And Germany is a good example because they do ban Holocaust denial and other forms of anti-Semitic speech. But one of the issues I dealt with when I was at the United Nations was a campaign on behalf of Muslim countries from around the world. And this was in the years after 9-11 and after the publication of the Danish cartoons, those satirical cartoons depicting the Islamic uh, prophet Muhammad in kind of compromising poses. And so these Muslim majority countries were demanding a UN resolution that would have ban the defamation of religion. So the publication of cartoons of that nature or other images of Muhammad or expression reflecting religious intolerance. And you know, one of their most powerful, I thought kind of potent arguments was you ban Holocaust denial. You know, you're protecting the Jews. Why aren't you protecting us? Like there are more at this time incidents of anti-Muslim discrimination uh, and hatefulness around the world and, and, and crimes directed at Muslims so we need protection too. And I thought that was a powerful argument. And, and we were able to say as the United States, representing the United States, well, Holocaust denial is permitted uh, under our law, under our First Amendment, we can't ban. And that actually put us on much stronger footing to push back against this call for a ban on the defamation of religion. So I think these line drawing exercises get very difficult. And we see examples in Europe of how these bans and prohibitions are sort of twisted around and used in unexpected ways, whether that's to suppress speech about Palestinian rights, because that uh, could be construed as anti-Semitic, or it's to uh, punish a woman for calling as part of the sort of French Me Too movement, uh, Baladon Park, uh, you know, she called her, her abuser, uh, you know, a pig, and that was considered sexist speech. So. There are all kinds of ways that these powers can be misused. And I think on balance, even though some of the speech that they protect is really uh, not necessarily deserving of pr protection, we are better off with a system that limits the discretion of government to police speech. I think that's very well put because what you, what you do when you ban hate speech legally is you create another category of legitimate censorship. And as soon as you have that category, it can be expanded in all sorts of directions, just in the way you talked about, in the direction of blasphemy, in the direction of, um, basically you give government another tool, which is likely at some point by some leader to be misused. Um, you know, one of the things I thought was so admirable about your book, Suzanne, is it's not just a, about the principle of free speech, it's sort of about how to do free speech. And you have advice for both speakers and listeners. And I, I thought the point about listening is really important because you know a lot of what we're dealing with right now is a problem of censorious listening. Um, people, people looking to be outraged. Um, we're, you know, social media feeds an outrage machine in which the response to speech you don't like is not just counter speech, not just objection, not just argument in the, in the classic liberal model of free speech, but a kind of movement to suppress it, to deplatform it, to, um, to, to muzzle it. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about this advice you give for listening basically how to, how to live in a world where spe free speech is legally protected in our standard and people every day are encountering things that outrage them. Yeah, so you know, I, I, I put forward a number of ideas. I mean, the first is to take into account intent and context when you're evaluating the import of speech. And I think that's something, particularly in our social media world that often gets lost, you know, a tweet, a tweet can travel halfway around the world while the, while the context is still getting its pants on, uh, you know, and, 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 and will never catch up. And so you see something that seems incendiary, it could be 
an image, a phrase, a comment, and the impulse on social media, because the premium is all on speed and pithiness, is to just react instantaneously and be the first one to call it out or make the pun or, uh, you know, have the snappy retort. When in fact, if you, you know, looked a bit harder, you might see that it was something different entirely. And I, you know, I talk uh, in the book about a number of different incidents. You know, when we gave an award to the surviving staff of the French magazine, Charlie Hebdo, uh, we were criticized by people who said that Charlie Hebdo was anti-Muslim. And, and, and in, in the face of that criticism, we had to take a close look at everything Charlie Hebdo had done. And there was one cover uh, image that had been published on, on the magazine that was a, a black woman who was depicted as an ape with a tail and ears. And it was kind of the most, on its face, horrifyingly racist image. And you know, I sort of thought, I thought, my gosh, maybe we really have given this award to a racist magazine. How could they have published this thing? This is like the most classic, you know, nefarious stereotype. And you know, then I looked into it a bit more. And what I learned was that Christian Taubira, who was then the French justice ministry, minister, uh, was the person being parodied in this drawing. And if you look closely at it, uh, the bottom right was this uh, symbol of the French National Front. And the image was in response to a right-wing politician who had called her an ape. And it was making, it was, it was ridiculing their bigoted uh, uh, and horrific views. And she understood that so well that when the cartoonist who had drawn that image, that cover image of her de depicting her as an ape, when he was murdered in the uh, killing at the Charlie Hebdo uh, headquarters, when, when 12 people were gunned down, when he was murdered, she gave his eulogy uh, because she understood that he was trying to skewer her critics and her detractors and uphold her her dignity and her position. And so it, it was a great example where of an image where I think to any American who didn't know that context, it would seem incredibly offensive, uh, you know, and yet if you probe further, it's something quite different. So taking that extra few minutes to see who's doing the writing, is this image what it purports to be? You know, is there any mitigating circumstance here that may inflect how I interpret what I'm seeing or hearing? So that's, that's sort of my per first principle uh, in terms of listeners. And then I go on to a few others, including being willing to forgive Aaron's speech under certain circumstances. Yeah, and what about for speakers? You have some advice for them too. And there's an interesting paradox there because if you're, if you're checking your, your speech to avoid offense, are you genuinely engaging in, in free speech? You know, look, none of us says absolutely everything that comes to mind, you know, nor should we, you know, I don't think we could live that way. We've always had taboos. We've always had self-restraint, even in the Penn Charter going back to 90, 1948, there's a uh, commitment to the robust defense of free speech, but also an acknowledgement that free speech implies a certain amount of voluntary restraint is the phrase that is used. And so, I think this is about a kind of reboot and updating of that idea of voluntary restraint. And I talk about it as conscientiousness with language. We live in an increasingly diverse society, uh, you know, with people of all ages, ethnic and religious backgrounds, life experiences. And so, you know, whereas in the 1950s, if you were publishing something in your local newspaper, it might be fair to assume that just about everybody reading it came from a similar educational and socioeconomic background and racial background to your own, that's no longer the case. We're publishing things online. They can reach audiences anywhere. You know, if you're standing in front of a classroom at most U.S. colleges and universities, it, it's a much more diverse student body. There may be people who don't share your assumptions, who don't get your jokes, who, uh, you know, look at issues through a very different lens. And so, what I argue is just we have to be cognizant of that and we have to be aware of who's in our audience and think through how something we say will be received, you know, whether that's by white Americans or black Americans or Latino Americans or the disabled or older people who are reading it or very young people who are reading it. 
And, you know, just by having that conscientiousness, what you can avoid is inadvertent accidental offense, which is so much of what we see sort of in our daily work ahead. People who don't intend to trip over one another uh, or cause outrage, but sort of inadvertently step into it, sometimes through a sort of negligence, just not doing their homework or the due diligence. I, and I, I, I talk in the next part, uh, chapter about the idea of a, a duty of care. And I argue that that duty of care increases depending on the situation. So if you have a big platform, if you're in front of a huge lecture hall, if you have your own talk show, you have a higher obligation to be prepared, to know your audience, uh, and to be thoughtful and careful in what you say. So I talk about Megyn Kelly kind of blundering into her comments about blackface on Halloween and how could this possibly be offensive. I think in her situation, when you have a whole team of producers uh, helping you put on that show, it actually does behoove you to be a little more on top of how mores may have changed over the last 30 years and not to make an assumption that how things were when you were growing up is necessarily the way that they are today. You know, on the similar token, if you're speaking out about a topic, and I give an example of a professor who goes to the UN, and he's sort of an expert on US domestic policy, but he's giving a speech about Palestine and Israel, and he sort of blunders into some language talking about Palestine from the river to the sea, which to uh, many people's ears implies uh, that the, the destruction of the state of Israel, that Israel wouldn't exist if, Pal if Palestine had all of that territory. And, you know, he said, you know, and I think quite honestly that he didn't construe it that way, he didn't understand it that way, he didn't know that that's what it meant. Uh, but, you know, you might say in a situation like that, if you're going to give a speech at a, in a public high profile forum on a controversial issue, maybe you want to run it by some people beforehand, you know, show it to someone, you know, to, uh, who knows the Israeli side of the argument, who knows the Palestinian side of the argument, so that at least, you know, and maybe you don't mind offending. And, you know, that may be uh, a, a perfectly valid choice. What I'm really trying to get at here is the inadvertent offense and how you can take some steps that lessen the risk of that. Right. But uh, I think maybe you would you would agree that the environment is one in which offense is taken far more readily and the potential penalties for offense are so much greater. I mean, I, you know, I was an opinion journalist for most of my career and I think I felt for 30 plus years when I was writing for various magazines like Slate and, and The New Republic and various other places that I could essentially say whatever I wanted. I tried to, I was careful, I was thoughtful, I did, I did research. Um, I happened to leave off writing for the most part a couple of years ago to start a podcast company. I think my timing was good because I was starting to feel that I couldn't do that anymore. That, that writing about certain topics was simply too explosive. It wasn't that I was gonna do something inadvertent. It was that people weren't going to tolerate certain kinds of opinions and even worse than that they were going to look for opinions that you didn't have accuse you of having them and then suggest punishments I mean particularly with anything to do with gender race to to I would say a lesser extent but there are a whole range of issues that if you're a smart writer now you kind of don't want to go near because yeah. b both of the reaction and because of the potential damage that you'll suffer. No, I know. I mean, I think about a lot, you know, the title of the book is Dare to Speak. And I, I sort of often find myself thinking, you know, dare to speak indeed, as I contemplate, you know, writing about some of these topics and particularly in recent months, because it really is easy to get tripped up. And one of the things I argue in the book is that I have a whole chapter devoted to the idea that it is, crucially important that we continue to talk and write about difficult ideas. And I try to explain how you can do it even amid this climate of sometimes kind of radioactive sensitivity where it just feels like the risk of blowback is so great that it's just not worth it. And you're better, better off starting a podcast company than uh, continuing to write opinion columns. I do think that it can be done and that, you know, some of the elements are basic, like doing your research and your homework and anticipating the counter arguments. And I give examples of people who have talked about, you know, touchy topics like the Israel lobby, 
uh, but in such a way that they can't really be construed as anti-Semitic, because you know that argument is going to be out there, and that you know if you're taking on this topic, that's what could, it, what's going to come back at you. And there are ways of disarming it preemptively, you know, if you acknowledge that from the get-go. But it is it is fraught uh, to enter into some of this territory. And I do think, you know, I also talk about sort of an, a related sensitive topic, which is sort of these, you know, what's called in the literary world sensitivity readers. So it's people who, when someone has a book manuscript, let's say it's a young adult book and it has, it's a white writer, but it has some, uh, you know, Muslim American characters or characters from Bangladesh, having someone who has that background give it a read to make sure that what you've written is true to life, that you're not getting any of the facts wrong, that it's not gonna be inadvertently offensive. And I find I do that with some of my pieces about hot button political issues. Like I'll show it to someone who is 20 years younger than I am, just to see, you know, well, how is this gonna, you know, come across to someone who's in their 20s? Uh, you know, is it gonna rub them the right way? Because I, yeah, I want those people as my readers. And so, I want to be framing my argument in, in a manner that's most likely to come across to them. Or I might show it to a black board member of Penn if I'm talking about race issues because I want them to anticipate for me how a particular audience might respond to what I'm saying and actually help me hone the argument so that it's more likely to be persuasive. So I don't think it's all negative. And I think you've got to sort of push yourself to go to these extra lengths to find a way to make the argument there. I think there's almost always, if it's a legitimate argument, there's always a way to make it. And if you're careful, it doesn't mean you'll eliminate all blowback, but I think you can sort of tamp it down in such a way. And those can end up being some of the most powerful pieces once they're done. Yeah, I mean, I think that's all excellent advice. And I, you know, I intend to take a lot of it when I, when I write things in, in the future. Um, but there is, it is undeniable, it seems to me, that, you know, particularly in the kind of journalism that I've always been involved in, the goal has gone from being interesting to the goal of avoiding being interesting. I mean, you want it, the goal is now to, to sort of get away with, with saying what you want to say without, without suffering tremendous consequence, as opposed to being provocative. You know, M Michael Kinsley, who was my mentor in journalism, used to say that, you know, if you, until you've gone too far, until you think you've gone too far, you haven't gone far enough, right? Putting the argument in the most extreme version to test it out, to see if it really makes sense. Um, you can't do that in the same way anymore. Look, I think we're in a difficult moment. I mean, I do think it's sort of, I think of it as a swinging pendulum. And I think, you know, Trump's election sort of swung the pendulum in one direction. There's been a uh, powerful, potent reaction to that, where people sort of feel like these, uh, you know, bigotry has been let loose throughout society. It's kind of coursing through the veins of America. And, and it is their job to stop it, you know, within the small spaces that they control, whether that's the family dinner table or the boardroom table or the pages of a magazine. And so there's this kind of extreme sort of policing of anything that could be construed as contributing to a climate where certain groups and populations feel victimized or marginalized. So I think we're in a, a kind of extreme version of that. I hope that we settle back towards something towards the middle. But I also think, you know, at some level, you have to acknowledge, like, it's not without any legitimacy. You know, when you've had a, a history where certain groups, like, let's face it, white men have dominated so many of these magazines and publications for so many years. And, you know, they have had free reign, they've written brilliant things, but there have been, you know, at the same time, whether it's stereotypes or, uh, depictions of other groups that, you know, may not reflect the way those groups see themselves or want to be described or portrayed. And, you know, now we're opening up the gates in those settings. There are more women writers, there are more writers of color, there are more people questioning, you know, the way things have historically been interpreted, bringing new experiences to the table, you know, arguing that uh, perspectives that were historically left out of sort of settled histories of particular time periods now need to be brought forward. And 
there is something positive to that. I mean, you are hearing new voices, more voices at the table. There's more kind of give and take. You know, I also think it has some unfortunate byproducts, which is, you know, this sort of fearful silencing effect. And that's part of what I want to try to uh, argue against in the book. And, you know, I have a whole chapter that's devoted to sort of conscionable call outs, because, you know, I think what you're talking about in part is this call out culture where, you know, anything that bothers someone becomes the basis for, you know, almost a whole campaign that gets waged uh, online to inflict shame, to publicize, you know, the errant speech, uh, to, to put people on alert, to stigmatize the individual. And I think that can be very damaging. And in many situations is just unwarranted and totally disproportionate to what can be a, a really minor and often unintentional offense. So, you know, at the same time, just to finish, I would say kind of acknowledging that there, you know, it's not like everything was so perfect 20 or 30 years ago. You know, there were people who were left out of the conversation. There were perspectives that were missing. And the addition of all that, you know, does re represent a positive just in terms of the breadth of ideas in our discourse. Well, absolutely. I agree. Um, we'll open it up to questions in a minute, but I wanted to hit you with one more big topic, which is social media. Um, there's this conundrum when we think about free speech in relation to, say, Facebook or Twitter, which is both that under the law, those platforms have free speech, which includes the right to censor, presumably, whatever speech they don't want, but at the same time, they're public fora where political discussion takes place in a kind of primary way. So what's the right way to think about the battles going on at the social media platforms around what should al be allowed to be said? Yeah, well, it's complicated. I mean, I would say, you know, I do say in the book a couple different things. Um, I have one chapter that is devoted to why we should be leery of increased corporate controls over speech. You know, now just a handful of internet companies uh, account for what years or decades ago used to be the role of, you know, newspapers, magazines, coffee clutches, bulletin boards, town meetings, you know, family photo albums, and you know, all these other sources of media and information that have been kind of rolled up into the one, the one being your, your Facebook or your Twitter feed. And so their control over our public discourse is sweeping. And particularly for young people, they overwhelmingly get their news and information from social media. And so I think we have to be leery about these corporations that have profit motives, they have their own ideologies, they have business models very often that are predicated on elevating the most incendiary, explosive uh, speech that it, it drives engagement, that intrigues people, that people want to talk about or share or, or uh, get alarmed over. So to entrust them and ask them to arbitrate you know, all sorts of lines about the permissible limits of whether it's hateful speech or harassment or cyberbullying or political speech in particular, politicians' lies, when are they just hyperbole, when do they cross a line, it just gives them a tremendous amount of unfettered power. And these, these companies are private, they're non-transparent, they're not subject to disclosure rules, uh, you know, the way that a public institution would be, that you can't sue them under the First Amendment, they are not bound by it. And so I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's something that we have to be very careful of. At the same time, you know, we see by the day the harms that uh, social media and online speech can cause, you know, whether that's online harassment or uh, you know, now the, this rampant spread of disinformation that is polluting our election process and undercutting our democracy in the COVID-19 context, quackery and conspiracy theories, sometimes letting people to, leading people to take deadly steps. And so I think you have to hold both those ideas in your head, both that they're dangerous to uh, empowering uh, these companies without limits to control our speech and that uh, online speech can be very harmful. I ultimately think where it's going is in the direction toward more aggressive policing of speech by the platforms. Their advertisers are demanding it, consumers are demanding it, and increasingly regulators are calling for it and in some cases going to enforce it. 
And so what I argue in the book is that as that happens, we need to create a much more robust fail safe uh, customer service and speech protection arm that will work on behalf of those who inevitably there are going to be a lot of false positives as the platforms become more aggressive and taking down nefarious forms of speech there's going to be a lot of legitimate speech and expression whether it's satire or something that's been misinterpreted or taken out of its cultural context or something that's a private joke all sorts of things are going to be taken down without adequate justification and what we really need is for people who believe their speech rights have been impinged upon and that their speech has been uh, removed or demoted without basis for them to have a ready recourse so that they can rectify that in real time. The way you can deal with the situation if your credit card gets denied at the point of sale, you call a number, you get customer service on the line and you know the transaction goes through. I think it should be the same for free speech. When you get interrupted on a platform and you have a good case to explain why you should be allowed to make that post, you should be able to solve that in real time and uh, you know have your say. Yeah. All right, we have some very good questions here. Um, the first one is from Antonio Gonzalez. I'm going to um, summarize it a little bit because it's it's a little a little long the way he wrote it. Um, but we, you know, he's we've been talking about um, sort of the uh, the left attack on hate speech, but he points out that there is you know conservative attempt to muzzle speech through leg legislation of various kinds, and particularly um, anti-Israel boycott laws. And he says the anti-Israel boycott laws seem to be totally ignored by free speech people. Well, they're not, you know, I, I mean, he's right. Uh, it, it's a valid point. I mean, these are laws that essentially in some states would require companies doing business with the state to disavow any in, uh, intent or willingness to participate in a boycott as a condition precedent to getting a, a contract to, you know, for example, supply a state university with you know uh, plates and utensils for the dining hall. So, I to us at Pen America, it is a clear infringement on free speech, and we have protested against those laws. And I, you know, I think you're right that you know it's a good illustration of just the hypocrisy that can come in when you know there is a movement, and you know we at Pen America we don't endorse uh, boycotts. We see them as uh, counterproductive when it comes to the free range of ideas and, and international exchange, which is something that is a very important part of our mission. So we don't endorse boycotts, but we don't believe uh, that, that people should be compelled to disavow boycotts uh, as a condition of doing business. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's a good illustration to me of the ways in which, and I, I have another chapter in the book devoted to this, the politicization of speech. And, you know, it's not a new idea uh, so the old phrase was free speech for me and not for thee, but people have always been quicker to defend the free speech of rights, rights of those they agree with than of their detractors. But that tendency has gotten much more pronounced. And we see the Trump administration, President Trump has often uh, spoken of himself as a, as a champion of the First Amendment and free speech. And yet when it comes to the press freedom of journalists who cover him through a critical lens, you know, he tramples all over it. And you know, we also see at the Supreme Court a much more pronounced tendency among the justices to side with the speaker in First Amendment cases where the expression is ideologically akin to their own orientation. So the Republicans defending conservative speech and the Democrats defending liberal speech, but the Republicans uh, are, are far more pronounced in that ideological predilection. So I think it's it's very important to point out these hypocrisies, and we do a lot of that at Penn. And if you're a principal defender of free speech, you should absolutely be out there defending the right to support a boycott of Israel, even if you think the idea of a boycott of Israel is abhorrent. Correct. You know, and I, I have a whole chapter in the book about defending speech with which you disagree, and it's not easy to do, but the right, the right to express it, you know, that old idea that uh, I, I, I disagree with you, but I'll defend to the death your right to express your views. Yeah, um, I'm going to choose the second of two questions from Joan Chinitz, who says, how do you deal with parents who just don't want their children exposed to any speech or topics that makes them feel uncomfortable? Yeah, I think that's really problematic. 
I mean, I, I think living in a diverse society, uh, and really in any society, you have to develop uh, an ability to engage with people unlike yourself are going to have different views, views that might trouble or disturb or unsettle you. And that being able to engage in dialogue with them and uh, you know, know how to defend your own point of view, know how to persuade others, be willing to listen and hear out di different perspectives is extremely important. I do worry that sort of this impulse to protect, which I think is uh, well motivated. I think it's um, you know, out of a sense of compassion and a recognition that many people in this society have been subject to pretty relentless uh, and harsh, whether it's racism or sexism or other forms of discrimination. So the impulse to protect is a good one, but when it kind of translates into trying to afford you know, comprehensive safety so that you'll never hear anything that unsettles or disturbs you, I think it goes too far. And I think most people, uh, you know, advocates, you know, no matter what community they come from, will say that they've learned something from being in the rough and tumble and having to engage with people and ideas that, uh, you know, at times uh, did not make them feel comfortable. Yeah. Uh, Yossi Leibowitz uh, poses the the famous hard case around hate speech in this country. He asks, could you reflect on the Skokie demonstration by the neo-Nazis in a neighborhood that was largely Jewish and had many Holocaust survivors? Yeah, like, you know, the way I would see that is that it was, you know, a nasty, provocative, intimidating campaign that, you know, uh, had as its goal you know, this, this, this demonstration of strength, uh, you know, to belittle uh, and, and, and frighten people. Uh, and yet, the fact that the ACLU sided with the Nazis and that there was a counter movement to say, look, this type of protest as objectionable and con uh, con condemnation worthy as it may be, is perfectly lawful in this country actually disarmed it and you know they the nazis never did have their march you know they had the right to have the march they didn't even bother doing the march because i think the whole purpose of the exercise was probably to be shut down and to be able to grandstand that their free speech rights had been violated and we see a similar phenomenon uh you know just within the last few years on campuses where you had this pattern of right-wing extremists like Richard Spencer and Milo Yiannopoulos trying to gain forums to speak on college campuses. And students would protest it. They'd call upon the administration to block it from happening on the grounds that it was going to make students feel unsafe. And, you know, the first time around, sort of Berkeley fell for the bait and they, uh, the Milo visit was canceled. And then, of course, he sued. He grandstanded. He went out to his supporters. He raised more money. He became sort of a national figure, got a big book contract. And, you know, we began to give the advice that in that circumstance, it's actually better for the university to say, you know what, we disagree with this, you know, we want no part of it, but if they've lawfully, you know, registered to use the auditorium, you know, that's their first amendment, right? So it's going to happen. And they did that at the University of Florida with Richard Spencer. And, you know, it sort of went off without a hitch. And, you know, it was not that well attended. And people were clear that the university didn't support the message. And so ultimately, I think that's a better approach. And, you know, the University of California at Berkeley got wise eventually and allowed Milo to come. And then his event uh, just fizzled out completely. Right, because if you make them into First Amendment martyrs, you give them a good issue instead of a bad issue. They want nothing more than to be shut down and prevented from speaking exactly. because that's that's the that that's that becomes amazing. a rallying cry um uh, rebecca fry has a question which i'm, I'm going to also paraphrase a little bit um i think i understand it though she says you know it says on on social media um the the blowback and harassment is such that many people at some point just say forget it it's not worth it and this is particularly true of, of women and people in various vulnerable groups who experience the, the worst of this kind of abuse that isn't, isn't well moderated on social media platforms, those people are being silenced. And so the, the, the people attacking them are having the effect they want without technically violating anyone's free speech. What do you do about that? 
Yeah, it's a real problem. We actually have a whole program at PEN America dealing with online harassment and a whole website called our Field Manual on Online Harassment that I really commend to you because the goal of it, we, we recognize exactly what the questioner is saying, which is that this is an impairment of free speech, that people are being driven off, on, uh, off the platforms and oftentimes they need to be on there for professional reasons or to do research and yet the harassment can be so intense if you write or, or tweet about controversial topics that, uh, you know, it often crosses over into death threats. And so we give a whole lot of advice that really is geared toward helping people stay safe and stay online and have their voice. And we have a section that's devoted to people who are targeted by harassment, uh, a section devoted to their employers. So what newsrooms and editors and publishers ought to be doing to support these voices. And then a section for allies. And we've actually been doing trainings in newsrooms all across the country. We've now developed an ally and bystander training about how you can help. So you can check that out on our website. And I think it's extremely important that we mobilize. You know, there's not that much you can do because as you say, most of these harassers, I mean, if they make a true threat, that might be legally actionable. But over, you know, what, what really has this thunderous, censorious and silencing effect is the multiplicity of comments. You know, if it were one or two people saying something, that would, you know, you brush it off, but it's sort of tens of thousands and it's pervasive. And so no one person is really doing anything so wrong. They're just being obnoxious, but the cumulative effect of it is censorious. And so we think ultimately, you know, while there's some things that platforms can do essentially to give you much more control over what you see so that you can block it out and filter it out, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with tactics that you can adopt yourself in order to uh, feel safe and be able to express yourself while kind of keeping the trolls at bay. Yeah, like all these questions are good. So I want to see how many we can get to in the last few minutes. Um, Peter, Peter Brown says, how do you get people to be open to listen to points of view uh, with which they are strongly opposed, particularly now? the world dividing into sides and partaking in media that supports their own position and denies the other side. People always say they want to hear a variety of points of view. In practice, they gravitate towards hearing what they agree with and tuning out what they disagree with. Yeah, I mean, I think- The last part was my comment, that not right. part of the question. And there's but. sort of two things like, you know, what are the, form, the forums where people are going to encounter something that they don't agree with and you know I've, I've had conversations in recent days about the book with librarians and bookstore owners who themselves are feeling pressure to police what's available on the shelves and they're hearing from customers who uh you know get upset if there's a book that may be considered hateful that you know is available uh within the library and i think that's very problematic i think we desperately need though those institutions to remain places where you can find a whole panoply uh of ideas and i think when it comes to sort of in conversation, you know, so much of our discourse is so incendiary that I think oftentimes if you can just take down the register and kind of go at it very calmly and slowly and gently, you can actually put forward a point of view that someone doesn't expect to hear, uh, you know, in a way that sort of disarms them and maybe can create an opening for conversation. Yeah. From Sherry Dumar Hamilton, um, I'll, again, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly summarize. What about lies and disinformation? Should those things be allowed? They're certainly more prevalent even than hate speech. Yeah, so in 2000, early 2017, after the 2016 election, when sort of fake news exploded on the scene, we did a long report analyzing fake news through the lens of free expression and basically argued that even though overwhelmingly it is protected by the First Amendment, you know, you're allowed to lie, you're allowed to confuse and dissemble that fake news nonetheless constitutes a threat to free expression because free expression is not just the absence of government intrusions on speech. It's also you know, the ability to persuade, the ability for, uh, to, to have an environment where facts can rise to the foreground where we can search for the truth. If you look at the underlying reasons why we defend free speech, which I outlined in the last chapter of the book, you know, they really are at risk in an environment that is flooded with disinformation. And I think we see that, you know, very intensely now as we look ahead to an election where our democracy may be thwarted. So I think we have an awful lot of work to do 
to fight disinformation, but I would be very leery of expanding the power of government to do it because their definition of disinformation is going to be politically inflected. And uh, you, know, you can very easily imagine how that power would be misused. So that puts a lot more onus on whether it's social media platforms or institutions or even us as individuals to fight back against disinformation. We're actually doing at Penn trainings all over the country about how you can prevent yourself from be becoming a, a vector for disinformation. Yeah. Julia Fangold Covey asks, what's your reaction to Barry Weiss's New York Times resignation letter? Well, first I have to say hi to Julia Feingold Covey. He's an old friend okay. of mine. <laughs> Um, so that's a fun name to hear. You know, I, I mean, I sort of think it's like one of these instances where I kind of quietly say to myself, like, if the principles in this book had been adhered to, you know, maybe there could have been a different result. Like, was, you know, Barry uh, is a conservative commentator, you know, trying to make her way at the New York Times. Was she consistently conscientious? You know, probably not. I mean, none of us really can be all of the time. But I think she, you know, sort of had something of a needling and provocative quality in some people's eyes. She's operating in an intolerant environment where people are not willing enough to stick up for those who have uh, views antithetical to their own, where, where the value of that, I think, has been underplayed because people feel, you know, those views are so prevalent in society at large. Why do we need them here in the New York Times, you know, opinion section? So I think it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, it sort of ended in her departure. I don't think, uh, you know, I think there, there may have been something she could have done to uh, sort of find her way in that environment. But I, I, I think at this moment, you know, it is that sense of sort of policing the small spaces and a, a kind of intolerance for some of what we don't like that seems to be, you know, at large and on the rise and on the rampage throughout society. Uh, and just a, an absolute intolerance for anything that even reminds us of that or in any way resembles that, that uh, kind of intrudes on these realms that people sort of consider their own. Yeah. Okay, here's a, I think it'll, this will be the last question from Claire Alexander, who says you're assuming rational speakers on all sides of an issue in your advice to think before speaking and listen, listen in context. To what extent does your advice change if, one speaker is rational, as you assume, but another speaker is shouting and doesn't consider nuance. Yeah, look, I mean, obviously we know it's not, there's not like a clean, neat boundary line between the rational and the irrational. You know, we all sort of uh, teeter, you know, on one or the other side of that, I think at different times. I mean, obviously if you're dealing with someone, I mean, there's some people you just can't reason with and, and these principles won't do much good. You know, if someone's just ranting and raving and they're not interested in the conversation and you know, we'll have, we'll always have those people in our discourse. My effort really is to sort of target, uh, you know, maybe it's the, 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 the mushy middle of, of 50 or 60 or 70 percent of us that I think, you know, most of the time are pretty rational, uh, you know, don't uh, feed off um, or delight in these speech-related conflagrations, you know, want to have meaningful conversations, want to learn something, and you know, a set of principles that can make that a little bit more possible. I think there always will be people sort of throwing rocks from the outside and uh, stressing the most incendiary and outlandish things, trying to elicit a reaction, you know, uh, to provoke or to create an explosion. And you know, there's no, I don't know, I don't know what you say to them other than uh, you know, trying to ensure that they're not in the majority and that uh, you know the rest of uh, that a healthy discourse can sort of uh, survive and proceed, uh, you know, it has enough strength and enough participants to do so. Uh, well, Suzanne, in the podcasting world, uh, one of our key metrics is how many people listen to the end of the show. And we count ourselves very successful if we get anything above 70%. And by uh, my uh, rough math, we've kept 90, 90 plus percent of our participants to the end of the program. So it was a great conversation. And I really want to thank you for, for joining me. Well, thank you so much. And thanks so much to Powell's. And everyone, please buy a book from Powell's. They're such a wonderful store. They, like everybody, has been sort of hit by the pandemic. And uh, we want them to stay, stay alive and to thrive. So, uh, so grateful for everyone's support. Yes, Suzanne, Jacob, thank you both. It was such an honor to welcome you.
As Suzanne said, please consider purchasing a copy of her new book, Dare to Speak. Uh, you can visit us at pals.com. Uh, while you're there, you can check out the lineup of other upcoming virtual events, and hopefully we'll see you at another one of our events soon. Suzanne, Jacob, thanks again. This was yeah, wonderful. Good night. Bye. Good night, everyone.